welcome, welcome everybody to the Heal Your Heart, Find True Love After Toxic Love and Be Happier Now virtual conference. I'm so excited today to introduce to you PJ Dixon. And today in this chat, PJ is sharing with us how confidence is the cure. And I'm so excited to talk about this topic because it's we haven't talked about it thus far. And it's so important to have that inner confidence. So let me tell you a little bit about PJ. He is a lifelong motivational speaker and an international transformational coach. I love that description. <laughs> who focuses on results. Yes. Despite his disability, which was expected to take his life by seven years old, he chose to live and live well. PJ truly lives an extraordinary life sailing, outdoor skydiving, indoor skydiving, and the list goes on and on. He's a former wheelchair athlete, international traveler, amateur watercolorist, founder of two nonprofit organizations, and four disabled sports programs, and published author, whoa, mouthful, and a 10th degree black belt, martial arts, and a woman's self-defense instructor and a meditation teacher. Awesome. I'm so excited for you to hear PJ's message. And I am your host, Denise Kavaleskis, and it is my mission to heal your heart and find true love, just like I did. I too was in a very emotional, verbal, financial, and abusive relationship for over 20 years and found true love after toxic love. And what lights me up more than anything in the world is to see you heal your heart and find true love after toxic love. And this conference was created with you in mind. And each of these experts were handpicked because they know exactly what you've been through and they have the tools to guide you through this time of need. So PJ, I'm so honored to have you on this panel of experts and even more excited for you to share your message on the topic of confidence is the cure. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks, Denise. It's a real honor to be here. I love women and I really believe that the world needs good men in it so women can return to their femininity. And it's always an honor to be of service to women. And if, I mean, if randomly there's some gentlemen on here too, to be of service to them also, because I believe that the uh, masculine and the feminine are not opposites, but instead complements. Absolutely, yeah, that is so true. It is a nice blend together. So let's get started in, in talking about confidence because I, I, I know for a fact this is a huge um, topic. Uh, we could talk about this for like hours and hours, but let's start here on confidence and where it lies in the brain. Like, how it works in the brain for us and against us. So what's really interesting is it's more about how the brain works that allows the confidence to be revealed. So if we look at the brain in very simply put in two different parts, there's the conscious and the, the unconscious, right? And so I make a very clear distinction between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. When I talk about you, I'm referencing the conscious. When I talk about it, I'm referencing the unconscious because often we need to say Shh, it because it just gives us that, <laughs> right? And so, yeah. and that's, now that's not to say that the unconscious mind isn't valuable because it's incredibly valuable. It's the point of a lot of um, women's intuition. And we wanna make sure that our unconscious is not working against us, but it's actually working with us as our best friend. And so one of the things is that the unconscious mind projects out in front of us, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not there's any potential danger, then it usually controls most of our actions or reactions versus our responses. I make a clear distinction also between reaction, which is a slave action and a response. And so if a reaction is something that's happening in you, it's probably because the unconscious mind is making decisions for you. This doesn't bode well for developing confidence this is just something that we go, okay, well, this is what happens instinctually, but it doesn't say anything about who I am or my character or my own personal power. So when we realize, hold on, is that me or is that my unconscious creating a situation for me? Mm -hmm. For example, um, I was talking with an actual psych uh, psychologist or, or psychotherapist, I don't know, a few months ago, and 
she said, she was telling me that one of her clients just continually comes back to um, her story. And she said, you know, I'm just, I'm going to let you tell your story one more time. And I said, do you mind if I, if I share an observation? And the, the therapist was like, sure, go right ahead. And I said, when I'm working with my clients, one-on-one or in groups or wherever it is on stage, I always make sure that people understand that it's not your story. And, and she was like, what do you mean? It is her story. She keeps telling it. And I'm like, it's not her story. It's her unconscious mind story. It's the story the unconscious mind has developed based on the programming of the past, the beliefs that have, were born from that, and the projections and fears of the future. So the, and the fact that that story is allowed to be told because the conscious mind isn't, isn't choosing what to think, it's allowing the unconscious mind to think. And so the conscious mind sometimes starts to buy into it. And that's when people say, oh, well, it's their story. It's not their story. Let's make a very clear distinction. So I always say, think your thoughts. Don't let your thoughts think you. Because when you do begin to think your thoughts, this is when confidence starts to arise. Did that make Amazing. sense? Absolutely. And, and, <clears throat> and PJ, while you were talking, here's what came up for me, because I catch yeah. women saying this all the time. When they talk about the past, they, mm -hmm. they call their ex-husband or their ex-boyfriend or their ex-whatever, my narcissist. And I always catch them and I, and I say to them, without going too deep, I know you know this, but do you realize what you're claiming when you say my narcissist, just like you were saying about my story? It's something that we're attached to, that we're clinging to, that we're claiming as ours and we're reliving it, we're breathing life into it when we keep saying my story, my narcissist, you're claiming that as yours instead of letting it go and realizing, you know, what you just said, how beautiful it is to just realize that, no, it's not your story. It was at the time when it happened, but now, you know, the mastery of love, um, Don Miguel Ruiz, he explains it extremely well, how that was true then, but it's not true now. So yeah. You know, it may not, and the truth is it may not even be true. It may not even be the, the story that they're telling themselves. And they're like, even when we say, oh, well that it was true then, may not actually be true because what we're finding significant amount of memory is actually made up in the moment. And so what I think that I'm remembering from the person that I used to date or the former partner I used to have, right? So notice I didn't say usually, uh, I don't, it feels really like, like cutting somebody or cutting, you know, it's, there's a cutting feeling to me. So I tend to say like my former partner, right? Or your former partner, right? Which sounds a little softer, but referencing what you're saying about removing the, the my, this is what I heard you saying, removing the my, so you could just simply say the person that I, you know, I formerly dated, right? So there's this disconnect that occurs, right? Yes, it is a part of your past. So that part is factual, but what actually occurred, the reasons why it occurred, their role, your role, anybody else's role around you, some of that might not be remembered 100% accurately. So why buy into that mm -hmm. instead? Because what you're doing is you're looking backwards and trying to walk backwards into your future. That's crazy talk. Instead, why don't you decide to let go of the chains that bind you and release them so that you can move forward, looking forward at your future with a sense of freedom. I always say the doors to your future, the doors to your remarkable future are in your past. What I mean by that is if you think about this visually, think about one of those big iron ship anchors, right? Dug deep into the ground with part of the anchor sticking out at the bottom and, and um, you know, the, one of the little sharp corners and the top of it opened up or the top of it out of the, the ground where you can hook the chain. And think about a number of chains and ropes tied to that one part of the, the anchor. The anchor is your past, but these chains and ropes cling into or hook into or tie into different parts of your memory. They sometimes tie into your throat or your, your tongue, your voice, if people have squelched your voice. They tie into your heart if your heart's been broken. They tie into your guts or your, like, your body cavity if you feel anxiety or nervousness or worry. They even tie into your sex organs, right, if you've had some kind of trauma. And so when you're moving towards what you want, and if you're moving towards what you want quickly, like if there's somebody in your future that you're like, I really kind of like them, but I can't stop thinking about this other thing, or I'm afraid that they're going to be the same way, that they're also going to be my next mark, my next narc, 
my next narcissist, mm -hmm. right? So instead, what happens is, um, when I say the doors to your remarkable future are in your past, as you move towards what you want, if you move fast enough, boom, those chains go tight. Not all of them, but one of them will go tight, pull you off your feet and jerk you back into the past a little. That gives you a chance to look and go, okay, wait, where am I feeling that? What am I thinking about? What am I seeing in my mind? This is important. What am I seeing in my mind? What am I thinking about? What am I saying to myself? What am I feeling or what am I hearing in my mind, right? What are the words that I'm using? So once you identify that, how you're thinking, seeing, or feeling, then all of a sudden you can say, okay, how would I rather think, feel, or see instead? What would I rather see instead? The moment you start to change what you're seeing, the moment you change what you're feeling, uh, the moment you change what you're saying, all of a sudden the whole outcome begins to change. And so what you're doing is you're basically untying or unhooking one of those ropes or chains, setting it down because the past isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. It's not the past that's the problem. It's the bind, the binding or the tying or the rope or the chain, the link, the connection that you still have to that. Yeah. So that gets changed in the mind. That gets changed in the body. That gets changed in um, the way you're seeing um, the memory. So, and I can talk about that if you'd like me to go into more depth. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, I just don't know, like I, sometimes people like to like dialogue back and forth, but so look, think about this. Think about the person that you formerly dated, okay? The person that maybe your heart is still a little hurt over or um, whatever it is. Now, what do you see in your mind? Do you see a particular image of the two of you together? And now let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you seeing through your own eyes so it's as if maybe you're both in the car or on a beach or on a hike and you're seeing him or the situation through your eyes? Or are you outside of yourself seeing your, both of you? So that becomes a different thing. So if you're inside your eyes, switch so you're outside. So now you're seeing both of you and all of a sudden what you've done is you've changed your perspective. So that helps. Now, is, are you seeing it in color? If it's color, change it to black and white. Are, is it a sharp image or is it kind of blurry? If it's sharp, make it really blurry. If it's a little bit blurry, make it like so blurry that it's almost like the snow on in the old TVs that didn't come in or um, grainy, really grainy. Change it to like almost all grayscale or change it to almost black so you can't see it anymore. When you change the way you're seeing something, is it a movie or is it a still picture? If it's a movie, stop a piece of it and make it, just a picture, right? If it's a picture, um, or even once it's a movie, you turn it into a picture, make it smaller physically. Where, where do you see it? Do you see it in your head? Do you see it out in front of your eyes? Do you see it 10 feet away? Do you see it down there at an angle? Is it behind your head when you think about it? Do you do like this? You know, you're sort of looking back, but you're, you're sort of feeling it and remembering it in the back of your head. Move it to a different place. Pull it out if it's in your head. Pull it out and put it in front of you somewhere right? Um, if it's in front of you, fold it in half, roll it up, crinkle it up in your mind, use your hands to crinkle it up, throw it over your head and put it behind you. Anytime you change what you're seeing, the color, the size, the shape, the angle, the direction, the movement, anytime you change any of that, those, these are called submodalities of the visual scale, of the visual mode, right? When you change what you're seeing, all of a sudden you change what you're feeling because the brain is no longer using that same pathway because you've now interrupted it. It's a little bit like, like um, you're driving down the road and you've driven down this road a hundred times before and there's um, some kind of earthquake that destroys and creates, makes the road just sure rubble. You, you know, you can't go that route anymore. So the brain, when you change the visual component in the brain, all of a sudden the brain goes, well, I can't go down that route anymore. So it's not going to create the same sensations or feelings. Now, there's two other components that I would tend to talk with people about. What are you thinking? What are you hearing in your head? Maybe nothing, but if you are, is it the sound of their voice? Is it a particular phrase that they just said and you just can't stop hearing it over and over and over again? Change the quality. Where are you hearing it? Are you hearing it in your left ear? Are you hearing it in your right ear? Are you hearing it come from behind you? Do you feel like it's coming at you? Is it in your head? Change where it is. Pull it. If it's in your head, pull it out of your head and put it way far away over there or pull it out of your head and put it behind you. Change the quality, make that person some quieter, 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 like softer and softer, or squeaky and squeaky, right? Have that voice turn around and talk in a different direction from you. This is all the use of your mind. Now you've got two of these submodalities 
or two of these modalities that you're changing the submodalities in them. And when you do that, all of a sudden now it really has a hard time. So now it's not only that the road has, you know, um, rubble from the, the earthquake, but now some of the trees have fallen in it, right? So now there's all kinds of problems. You can't like, you can't drive through the trees. Now, what are you feeling? Or what were you feeling when that memory was coming up? Where did, were you feeling it? Was it how, what was the size of it? Did it create a color inside of you? How did it move? Were you feeling it in your throat? Did you feel it in your tummy? Do you feel it in your heart, in your chest area? How big, if it's in your chest, is it right at your heart? Is it below your heart where your rib cage comes together? Is it filling up the full cavity of your body? Is it towards the front of your chest? Is it towards your back? Is it filling up the whole thing? Is it just where your diaphragm is? Does it stop you from breathing? Does it cause you to catch your breath? So if that's the case, change it, pull it out of you, like physically use your hands to grab whatever's in you and pull it out, spin it a different color, change it or wad it up and throw it over your shoulder, but make sure you pull all of it out. And what you're doing is you're changing all the ways that your brain perceives that memory. And when you change the way it perceives that memory, you're basically causing it to take a different route to remember anything. And if I've got it in front of me and I just go, oh, it's a still picture. I see this guy's face. I feel this on my heart and I don't want to deal with it anymore. Shrink it down as small as you can, turn it around backwards, fold it in half, you know, with the, the, uh, the picture itself being folded on the inside, seal all the corners, crinkle it up like a, like a piece of wadded up paper, you know, and go to the bathroom and open up the toilet lid, throw it in the toilet and say sploosh, shut the toilet lid, flush the toilet, wash your face and your hands, you know, spin around in a circle, say a quick prayer of thanks and walk away. Because when you do these kinds of things, you pull these memories out and you say, you know what? I don't want this memory. I'm going to physically pull it out of my body, out of my mind, out of my throat, out of my heart. I'm going to physically like use my hands to actually pull it out as if there's like slime or goo or sticky tar in me or chains. I'm just going to pull all of these things out. But when you do this, make sure that you're looking behind your heart. Make sure you're looking under your heart. Check between your ribs, check in your back, check in your hips. Is there anything hiding in the different recesses of your mind? Pull it all out, okay, and get rid of all of it. And you can just change all of that. When you change the modalities, all of a sudden what happens is the parts that make you feel like you're not confident start to go away because, uh, well, because of the things you're doing. And once those go away, what are you left with? A sense of self again. And when you're left with a sense of self, there's a natural confidence there because your natural heart begins to shine again. Yeah. So amazing, PJ. And what came up for me, as you can see, I'm writing as you're talking is, um, so when you ask the question, what do I see? Um, I wanted to just share with the audience what I saw, which was a picture, a, a still picture of my ex, just mm -hmm. him, um, him alone. It was in color. It was a little bit blurry. It wasn't like very sharp, uh, but I felt nothing. I don't, I've done a lot of healing around him in Good. the past, but I, I don't hate him. I don't, you know, anything like that. Um, and the questions that came up for me, which you pretty much answered was, which thank you very much. Um, but I was thinking from, from the audience perspective is how do I do this? You did explain how we do this. And the next question came up was, um, how many times? So if the person listening to us right now says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try that. I'm going to do that. And after the first, maybe five times, it's still coming up the same way. So what do you say to that person that's tried it, practiced it X amount of times? What do you say if it keep, if, if it's not changing for them? So that's a really great question. First of all, it's going to change. Um, if you legitimately change any component of the image that you're seeing or what you're hearing or what you're feeling, if you change even one thing, then the result changes. I love this quote that says, if you focus on the results, you will never change. If you focus on change, you will see results. This is really important, okay? And so if you change or modify anything, you will see results. Maybe you're not seeing the results that you want. And so what I would say is if you really, like, let me ask you, when you saw that still picture that was in color, but it was a little blurry, right? And I could tell by the size of it, by the way you're moving your hand, 
and that you probably saw it in front of you about probably 12 inches away, maybe, maybe 10 or 12 inches away from you. Is that true? Mm -hmm. And it was about the size of an iPad, a little bit larger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I can tell by the way you're moving your hands. So I'm watching you. So did you shrink it down? Um, while you were talking, yes, and I did the folding okay. and all of that, yeah. And when you did that, what was the difference of your, of your thinking? What changed inside of your being? Um, that, just that it's, it's not significant, that the past is not significant anymore. Okay. Fantastic. So when people do this, when your audience does this, they're going to have a major reaction. And so when a uh, res result, and so when that happens, if they're like, I've still got a little clingy, I'm still feeling it, something's still nagging at me, that's great. So this is what, um, when I said that I generally break the mind up into two parts, the conscious and the unconscious, there's also the subconscious. The subconscious is that like, it's sort of the bridge between the unconscious and the subconscious, right? And so when you sort of feel that nagging sensation like around your, around your heart or in your chest or in your throat a little bit or your hands are a little sweaty or parts of your body just seem like they're kind of tense when you think about that person and you're not maybe you're not like like hurt anymore you're just like oh there's just still some residue left there's still some gunk left right i would say pause for a moment and get a feel of where it is identify what you're feeling first and then see if you can physically pull it out of your body and let's say it's in three or four or five different places, pull it all out of your body as if you're pulling out slime or tar or something sticky. It may not be sticky for you. It might feel like, um, it might feel like nails or razor blades when you're pulling it out. So you get to be aware of this sensation that you're feeling when you pull it out, pull everything out carefully. And, and it can float sort of right in front of you. You can pull it out with one hand and hold it in the other, or you can pull it out with both hands and let it just sort of let it float in front of you just so everything floats together in front of you. And then once you've pulled everything out, squash it down as, sm as small as you possibly can. Literally like squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it as small as you can. Squeeze it in your left hand, squeeze it in your right hand, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze until it's super duper small. And then go outside, okay? Or drive down the road and throw it out the window. Or flick turn it. around and throw it behind you. It's so small you can flick it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I often do that with people. I often say you can flick it. Like when I do a different exercise where they're getting bigger and, and the uh, other person is getting smaller, it's a power dynamic thing. And you can literally flick it. The thing is that it's so small, you don't know where it is. Right. And that's what's really important. And so you can get rid of it. So what's going to happen is if they do it once, they're going to feel it less. If they do it a second time, they're going to feel it less. If they do it three, four, five times, it's going to get less and less and less. Good to know. And so the piece is just to start being more subtly aware of where do I feel it and how am I feeling it. And those pieces that I feel, if like, let's say there's like one little piece left in my hip and it just, it just, I can't, for whatever reason, my body, my brain is storing that memory in that hip. What color is it? What shape is it? how quickly is it moving? Is it moving really slowly or is it still kind of fiery? Is it poking you or is it just taking up space? So give that some attention and you can actually reach in and pull, pull that out or you can breathe in and you can change the color of that. When you exhale, you can breathe it out. As you inhale, you can push everything that's coming in down. And as you do that, let that, that thing that's in your hip get pushed down into your thigh. And then when you inhale again, it's pushed down past your knee and then past your ankle and then out your toes or out the bottom of your foot. You can let it go and then feel yourself, keep feeling yourself with that. So as long as you're changing the way you're seeing it visually, what you're hearing, the sound quality, what it's saying or what the, the noise that it's making, you might, it might not be somebody's voice. You might be remembering a time when you guys had your worst fight and what you're hearing, your plate's breaking. Maybe you don't hear anything he's saying. Maybe you don't hear anything you're saying. Maybe you just hear cries, like mm -hmm. one of you crying. Maybe you hear plates breaking. Maybe you hear the sound of a kitchen that you guys are sat too close to the kitchen. You can hear the noise in the kitchen. Change the quality of that. Change the sound. Maybe make it sound like a circus instead. And then all of a sudden, these things change. So, and if you're physically feeling something, change the feeling by pulling it out of your body and then spinning it in a different way, giving it a different color color once you change it you can put it back in if you want or you can just get rid of it literally if you take something that's in front of you if you're seeing it in front of you and you, and you grab it with your hands 
you bought it up and throw it over your shoulder, your mind goes, oh, it's behind us. And so it stops thinking about it as much. Now, listen, if you're still experiencing this and you've done this one time and you got some results, two times and you got some results, three, four, five times, if you buy your fifth time, you're still holding on to it. Listen to my language. You're still holding on to it. Probably because you have a definition of who you are, right? It's an identity problem at that point. You have defined yourself and or accepted the identity that people have given you as not good enough, not worthy, not valuable, unattractive, un unlovable, whatever it is. And you've begun to believe that. And so now you're not wrestling with the sensations and the feelings. The truth is you're wrestling with your own identity. So we want to start to let go of that and start to go, wait a minute, is, is this really true? And you can do little layer, like little layer, just a single statement somebody says, right? Or a single look. Um, and you can change that. If, if somebody looked at you and you felt judged, you could, you could see that image again and go, okay, what would I rather feel instead? Literally, I say this, I'd rather feel instead. And then I say, oh, I'd rather feel joy or laughter or happiness or compassion. And so what if you consciously chose to feel that, see that image, but change the way you're feeling? And you change it to a place of empowerment, right? Or a place of compassion for the other, where you have, and maybe they don't have, it changes the power dynamics a little bit. So Beautiful. Two yeah, things thanks. came up, PJ. Yeah. Um, so can you use this with like other aspects of your life? So right now we're talking about relationships, we're talking about past relationships, we're talking about a person, but can you use this for other areas of your life, health, uh, finances, things like that? Absolutely, 100%. So let me tell you a story about finances, okay? Because um, I'm not a health expert and I'd rather have a specific question to be able to resolve, uh, discuss that, okay? Um, so if you look at finances, so many times people have a hard time like with money and every situation that you're in has a point of introduction, okay? Every thought you've had, every experience you've had um, has a moment of introduction. That moment of introduction usually sets the programming, mm -hmm. okay? It's usually the programming. The problem is that the programming very easily um, and very likely only gave you one option, right? So for example, my dad said to me when I was nine or 10, I said, dad, how much money do you make? And I can see exactly where we were in um, our house when I was little. And he looked down at me and he said, what are you asking me that for? That's rude. You never ask people how much money they make. Are you asking your friends how much money they make? If you're asking your friend's parents how much money they make, and I find out you're going to be in a lot of trouble, mister. And I'm like, eek. Right? So that changed my relationship with money. Instead, right. what he could have done. Now, see, what I, what I was given is one program. So I, I picked up the belief. And follow this, okay? I picked up the belief. So programming leads to belief. I picked up the belief that you're never allowed to talk about money and that I shouldn't have any relationship with money because money, conversations about money cause pain and suffering. So I thought, you know, I went from belief, from a program that was given to me to a belief, to, a, to thinking. And the thinking was, um, I'm not worthy to talk about money. I'm not allowed to ask about money. I don't deserve money because of a number of other ways dad handled, you know, my childhood regarding money. Um, going to restaurants, for example. Um, my mom always says that I have expensive taste. And um, so I would order something that was usually pretty high on the menu. And I didn't do it because I like to spend the money because I had no concept of money. I thought when you went to a job interview, you actually paid to, to, get, to, get, the, to get the job. Like I thought it was like an auction. You showed up to the interview and said, I'll give you this much money if you will let me work here. So I totally was backwards in my head as a little guy. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we would go out to eat and I would want to order like, let's say at a Chinese restaurant, I'd want to order something that had lobster in it. You know, not because I was looking at the price, but because that's what appealed to me. And my mom would always just smile and just say, you have expensive taste. And my dad would say, no, you're gonna, you'll, you'll never appreciate that. You're gonna get sweet and sour pork or whatever. I didn't like sweet sour pork at all, you know? So there was this whole feeling within me that I wasn't worthy of money. So I was thinking I'm not worthy of money, which creates a feeling. So now we go programmed to beliefs, 
beliefs lead to your thinking, the thinking leads to the emotion, the emotion leads to the action, and the, the action leads to the result. So if you are experiencing this, one of the things that you can do is go, okay, hold on. How do I walk this backwards? And then all of a sudden what you do is you find the origin, the root, the beginning, the introduction, the programming. And you go, okay, this is what was said to me. What did I believe? I immediately believed this. Okay, now, what if I were given three other options? And you give yourself three different options. Like I said, okay, what if I said, dad, how much money do you make? And yes, he scolded me. Okay, that's option one. I don't really like it. How about option two? I go, okay, option two. He said, well, son, you know, it's actually not very nice to ask people about how much money they make. You know, so please make sure that you're not asking your friend's parents how much money they make. So he was nice about it this time instead of mean and scary. So, mm, okay, but I still didn't really get an answer. How about option number three? He says, well, son, um, it's not nice to talk to people about money, but, you know, you're my son. And so this is how much money I make. Rubs me on the head and walks away, right? Or what if option number four, he says, hey, son, you have time to talk to your dad for a minute? And I say, yeah, of course. And he takes me into the kitchen with a pen and paper and he lifts me up and puts me on his lap. And he said, okay, now I'm gonna write a number on the paper and it's gonna seem kind of big, but then let's talk about it, okay? And he writes the number on the paper, $100,000 or whatever. And um, he says, that seems like a lot of money, huh? I'm like, that's a lot of money, dad, you're rich. And he says, well, let me show you what we do with money. And he sits down and writes down all of the bills and he talks about investments and he talks about setting money aside for vacations and playtime. And he talks about how to make money. And he talks about, he teaches me how to interview and he teaches me how to ask for a raise or start my own business. Wow, how amazing would that have been? What would that do to my belief system? What would that do to my thinking? I'm getting chills up my spine and in my brain right now as I talk about this. What would that do to my emotions and my actions and my results? It would profoundly change it. So even me just walking through that with you right now, Increase these chills on my spine. My brain is tingling. My little ears are tingling right now, right? You can see a smile on my face that's different than a second ago. Why? Because I now have options. The problem is when you, when you are stuck in a situation, it's because you haven't gone back. In some cases, you haven't gone back to identify the original entry point of the program that was set and identified what was the one option they gave. They didn't give me multiple options. So give yourself a couple of different options. Give yourself at least two or three and then say, well, you know what? I would rather this one and then walk yourself backwards and say, okay, well, if this is the programming that I got, what would my new beliefs be? And write them down. Just say, well, I think I would believe this. And I would believe this. And I would believe this. And I would believe this. Okay, cool. If this is how you believe, then how would your beliefs cause you to think? Well, you know what? If I believe this, I would probably think this about money. I would think this about money. I would think that I would be worthy. I would think that money is fun. I would think that I would know how to invest it. Okay. How are you feeling now about this? Yeah, this feels much better. If you can take care of the reprogramming and consciously talk about the, the, um, the beliefs you have and then consciously identify the thinking that would go along with or that will go along with that, the emotions and the actions and the results will take care of themselves. I think that is, I think that was meant to be asked. You meant it like it's going to land so well for the audience. I know it landed super well for me. Um, because I struggle. The thing is, is that when in, in a lot of narcissistic relationships, there's, there's financial abuse. So it could be the codependency, like in my situation where I was 100% dependent on my ex-husband for finances. And, or I also hear where the woman is the provider. She is in that masculine role of being the provider. And he is either just leaving it all for her or he's mooching off of her or, you know, so there's a lot of finances when it comes to these types of relationships. So I know that that came up for a reason and I am just so excited that you went into such depth over it, PJ. Oh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about this exercise that you're sharing with us is does it work for PTSD? 100%, but I would, I would do a different exercise for PTSD, okay? okay? There's something called timeline therapy. It's also referred to as mental and emotional release. Um, and so um, there's a number of ways. Um, actually, there's a couple of different things that you can do. I wouldn't necessarily use those. I could use those. But for PTSD, I might use something um, that looks a little bit more like a movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, and 
while you can do it by yourself, um, it's going to be, it's something that I would rather take somebody through. So I'll give you a brief explanation of it and then um, maybe add an extra piece at the end um, that might add some benefit. So the people that I've worked with with PTSD, for example, um, I had one gentleman who was a former military, well, he was actually in the military when I was working with him. And he was, had done three tours um, in combat areas. He had seen some pretty hor horrific things as a medic. Um, and he was now, when I was working with him, he was now in the reserves. So he had gone away for his two weeks over the summer. And I got this sense, like about a week in, I was like, I know he's still gone for another week, but I'm going to text him and just see if he's okay. And just as I was about to text him, I got a text from him that said, hey, I'm back. Um, I wonder if we can talk. And, you know, I've got some problems going on. And I was like, okay, well, let me, how are you? Are you okay? And so um, I talked to him and he said that what was going on was these people that he was in charge of weren't taking their weekend, their week-long retreat or their two-week retreat. Seriously, they were leaving their guns laying around. They were walking around. They weren't carrying their, their weapons as if they were in combat. And so he started having flashbacks that he never had before. He was literally having flashbacks that were seeing some of the horrific things that he'd gone through. But what was worse is he was seeing all of these people as in the future dead with their weapons lying all over the place because they weren't listening to what he was teaching and telling them to do. And they weren't taking it seriously. They were just there for the paycheck. And so he said, you know, the military is, has assessed me. They said, I'm going to need two therapists. It's probably going to be three years of work or, or longer. And I said, no, we're going to fix that right now. And he said, well, what do you mean? Like the, the military? I said, no, we're going to fix that right now. So I took him through this base. I'm going to give you the basic version, but because I can't take you personally through it. And so like, I'll explain it. Um, and then people can sort of play with it if they want um, and see how it might work. Now, some people might think that, that I shouldn't be doing this, but I do this stuff on my own brain to practice and to play. So I think people are going to be relatively okay. So here's what I'd like for people to do. Imagine a movie theater, okay? You're in the, you, you walk into the movie theater. Nobody else is in there. Big screen. You find the comfiest seat, place that you want, maybe in the center, maybe in the back, maybe in the front, wherever you like to be, you find your seat. Most people like to sit, you know, fairly like in the middle. And there's sometimes a rail, you know, that where uh, for the people that like start to walk up the steps, so some people like to sit close to the rail and put their feet up. Just get comfortable, right? Just get comfortable. Now what I would like for you to do is I would like you, now that you know that you're there, I would like to picture yourself again, but I'd like for you to picture yourself inside of the movie projection room, okay? But I want you to see yourself in the movie projection room or see through your eyes rather as if you're in the movie projection room. And I want you to look down through the projector window and see yourself sitting down there eating jujubes or milk duds or drinking you know, soda or eating the popcorn or the hot dog or whatever it is that you're doing. See yourself down there. So see through your own eyes, but see yourself down there doing whatever you were doing. So you've got this, this dissociation, okay? Now what's gonna happen is when we press play, the scene that you play over and over and over in your head that creates the PTSD is gonna be coming out of the video camera or the, the projector and shining up onto the screen. So your job being in the movie theater is twofold. One, do not watch the screen. Only look through your own eyes, through the projector window, down at yourself in the theater. Don't look at the screen. Look only at yourself down there in the theater. Watch yourself watching the, the movie on the screen, okay? Only play the scene that you see over and over and over. As soon as you see that, stop it, stop the record, the projector, rewind it, okay? Like literally let it rewind. And so you can rewind it with the lights on so you can see it rewind, okay? And then you're gonna stop it where it starts again, okay, where it always starts. You're gonna press play, and you're gonna run it forward again. So this is the, 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 pro, the process. We're gonna press play, let it play out. As soon as it's done, you stop it, rewind it, you stop it, and then you play it again. The whole time you in the projector studio is looking down at yourself in the theater, okay? Now here's the thing, as soon as 
you're done with that scene that you always see, it fades to black. And that's when you know to hit rewind. And you can see it rewind, okay? Or you can let it say black and rewind it. Totally up to you. I think it's wonderful to just let it play backwards and then let it fade again, okay? So it fades to black again. Some people prefer to see it fade to white, that's fine, okay? There's not a distinction, white, black. Let it fade to gray for all I care, just let it fade. But here's what's gonna happen. Every single time you play it forward, the color is going to get more and more black and white. And then after it turns black and white, you've rewound it and played it, rewound it and played it. Um, and you probably only need to do this a few times, okay? Um, and it can be done in just a few minutes time. But as it starts to go to gray, now have it start to get really scratchy, right? So it's really grainy, it's hard to see. And every time you play it forward, it gets more and more and more grainy, more and more just sort of monochromatic, more and more like just so damaged that you can't see it at all, okay? But also every time you change the visual quality, every time you change the visual quality, you're also changing the sound quality. It gets softer so it's harder to hear, the voices change from being aggressive or, or hurtful or scary to like weird and like maybe cartoony or weak and um, squeaky in nature. So like we always think of a mouse as being kind of squeaky, right? Squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. Not very strong. I'm not afraid of any kind of mouse. So you can change all the voices to being kind of squeaky, but they're also going to get quieter and quieter and scratchier and scratchier. So pretty soon you're like, wait, I, I don't even know what they said. Like I can't even understand a word what, what they said. So you're changing the visual component and the auditory component simultaneously, okay? And pretty soon you'll get to the point where when it fades to black after going forward, you go, well, how do you feel? And you're like, I don't really feel it anymore. So let's rewind it one more time and run it again, run it again, so grainy, scratchy, so, so much messed up that you can't see it or hear it. It's like this, right? And you go through it again and you're like, okay, well, how do you feel? Probably don't feel anything. Okay, so what you've done is you've interrupted the regular route that the PTS has been taking. Okay, you're changing the visual component, you're changing the audio component. If there's a physical sensation in there, you can also change that um, along the way. So looking down at yourself from the, the box, looking down at yourself, watch yourself change and feel differently inside. Okay, you might feel differently inside of yourself and then See if you can see how you down there in the theater is actually feeling differently. Are you a little more comfortable? Are you a little more relaxed? Are you less on edge? Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I think this is so valuable. Okay, great. It's usually much easier if I do it with somebody mm -hmm. um, so that I can guide them through it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, remember I said I wanted to add a little piece. There's also something that I do um, called Ho'oponopono. Now, I learned it from my teacher and I like the way that he does it, but it's a method of forgiveness. So if you can find a way to forgive the person in front of you, meaning in this case, the person that you formerly dated um, or were involved in a relationship with. <clears throat> um, the short version is if you can find a way to forgive yourself for everything that you did to them and ask for their forgiveness for what you did. And if you can find a way to forgive them for everything that they did and then forgive all the people, I'm giving you very, again, very brief, how to and then forgive all the people that were related to causing that person to be the way they were and then you say your last goodbyes to them and they sort of walk away and you turn and walk away um, before you do the, the goodbyes and walk away sever the connection between your thoughts between your minds sever the connection between your voices your throats sever the connection between your hearts sever the, the connection even between your tummy if there's some kind of like bad feeling inside your guts, like my guts just get in knots whenever this person's around, sever the feeling between your sex organs, right? Um, and I'm not going into it in depth, but it's a process that I take my clients through. And it's really a beautiful process. I've done it myself. I've done it to myself to be able to forgive some things that my dad did, mostly around money. And when you start to let go of that, all of a sudden, you feel free again. When you let go of the things that hold you down, when you let go of the beliefs that make you feel less than, the only thing left is kindness, love, confidence, joy, you know, presence. Freedom, liberation, yeah, space. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's so beautiful and so amazing. And that's what I want to share with 
with everybody is that when you do this work, that's what you get in return. You get that, that freedom, that liberation and that, you know, ah, it's just so awesome. Well, I know that you have a gift for the audience. Um, yes. Can you tell us about that? Sure. It's called five ways to date yourself. And one big reason why you should five ways to date yourself. And one big reason why you should, it's a 109 page ebook. People are like, dude, you should sell this. What are you doing? Like make it a real book. Right. I'm like, ah, it's free for now. So anybody who wants it, um, all you have to do is go to five ways dot pjswisdom.com five w a y s dot pjs wisdom.com and i'm sure you've got the link yeah. and you'll put it in the email to them so yeah. yeah just download it and if you have any problems um just email me pj at pjswisdom.com pj at pjswisdom.com and just say hey I'm having a hard time downloading it cool and i'll just send it to you awesome thank you yes. so much you're welcome. It's, My pleasure. Yeah, it's been amazing talking to you, PJ. And I swear we could we could just another two hours of talking. <laughs> this was yes. so amazing. Um, I know it was amazing for me, and I know it's going to land really well with the audience. Um, I, I just have that feeling that it's perfect. So um, thank you for being here. It's been an honor to have you as a guest on the Heal Your Heart, Find True Love After Toxic Love and Be Happier Now virtual conference. And to you, the audience, thank you so much for being here and investing this time in you, investing this time into your healing. You're so worth it. Take advantage of PJ's gift, and I will see you on the next interview. Bye, beautiful Bye. people. Bye.